Recorded live. Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our Exorcist retrospective with, with William Peter Blatty's Exorcist 3 Legion, or many other titles you may know it as. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have. So warning, spoilers ahead from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, screenwriter of the new 3DS game TMNT based on the movie. With me from Austin is Tony Savaggio, lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars, co-creator of the comic Psychom from Tokyo Pop, and Clockworks from Humanoids. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Drew Edwards, writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man from Monsterverse Comics. Say hello, Drew. Hello. Hello. And every week I call you Mr. Drew, and this week I somehow dropped the Mr. And then I felt instantly bad when I did. So disrespectful. So, so I... Yeah. I, the first apology... All right, it's all right. It's all right. You, Mr. Drew. And, as always, color commentary from attorney Julia Guzman. Say hello. That's Miss Julia to you. Hello, Miss Julia. All right. According to Wikipedia, The Exorcist 3 is a 1990 American supernatural horror film written and directed by William Peter Blatty. It is the third installment of The Exorcist series and a film adaptation of Blatty's novel Legion, which came out way back in 1983. Set 15 years after the original film and ignoring the events, ignoring the events entirely of Exorcist 2 the Heretic, the film centers around a character from the first film, the philosophical lieutenant William F. Kinderman, who is investigating a baffling series of murders in Georgetown that appear to have a satanic motive behind them and may have all the hallmarks of the deceased Gemini serial killer. The film was originally called Legion, but it was changed to The Exorcist Three by studio executives of Morgan Creek Productions to be more commercial. The film itself also has a drastically altered ending that was altered in post-production with reshoots imposed by Morgan Creek, uh, productions, and they demanded last-minute edition of an exorcist sequence for the climax of the film. Now, that version differed from Blatty's vision, but he himself did actually film that material. Blatty has since expressed desire to go back and re- reconstruct his original film. However, all of the cut footage is reported to be lost. Okay, that's a lot, a lot more introduction than we normally do, but it is an interesting way to get into this really fascinating little uh, uh, artifact of film, The Exorcist Three. So uh, let's go first impressions. Give me your basic take on this and where we are now, smack dab in the middle of our Exorcist retrospectives, and if you like where you were when you saw this. So let's go Drew, Tony, uh, Tony. Drew, Tony, Joya, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll go. Um, Drew, lay it on me. First impressions, Exorcist Three. Uh, you know, I, I said it repeatedly while we're doing this retrospective. I really like this movie. I think it's it's creepy, very creepy at a lot of times. I love the interplay between uh, Kinderman and Dreyer as characters. Just the, the dialogue between them is so snappy and has that kind of old Hollywood feel, which, which really appeals to me. Uh, you know, it is a bit muddled, at times, but, you know, overall that does not take away from my enjoyment of the movie. And, you know, it's also just really, you know, really great to see uh, a lot of the good character actors that they have in this movie. Uh, you know, Brad, Brad Dorif, actually seeing Brad Dorif as opposed to just hearing him as Chucky is, is yeah. really nice. And he's, he, he kind of actually refers to child's play he actually makes a difference yeah that 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 crack and then it then it cuts to a little kid that kind of looks like yeah, it looks like Chucky, but, yeah. um it's it's a it's a it's a cool flick and very underrated and i i think a lot of people don't bother watching watching it because they're so put off by exorcist 2 and they're kind of missing out wow yes i i i think that i think that is a major thing that that movie scares them away tony First Impressions, Exorcist 3. I really like this movie. Um, I saw it as a summer. Again, like I've said several times, I used to spend summers with my grandfather's in Hearn. And uh, he lived out away from town. There were, like, train tracks, and the house kind of creaked a little bit, and there were, like, engine noises from uh, engines that irrigated the cotton field that he had and that he ran. And... Just all these little bits when you were watching a movie really late at night and it was super dark made 
things extra creepy. Um, and so seeing a really truly creepy film like this <laughs> was double creepy in under those circumstances, and that was really great. So I have a really fond memory of this, especially since I I didn't see it at the time, but I'd heard Exorcist 2, which is garbage, which it actually is. But uh, and so I had skipped that, and I watched this. Oh, I'll, I'll check that out. It, you know, I've never seen Exorcist Three, and oh man, was I surprised! And it's it's just solid. Like it's got a lot of great scares. It, you know, watching it this time, I can kind of see it's you know it gets a little uneven um, in parts that I hadn't remembered it being uneven in, um, which is unfortunate. But it's it's really solid. So. I really enjoy the movie a lot. Very cool. Um, Julia, what are your first thoughts? Um, I'd like it, but I think I would have liked it a lot more. I think I would have liked William Peter Blatty's film that he wanted to make a lot more than the film that he, they ended up making because he wanted to make Legion, and he didn't want to have an exorcism in it, and he didn't want any of that. Yeah, you know, He just wanted it to be this kind of cycle of horror kind of movie and um uh, and I think that would have been a better film. I think that throwing the exorcism in just really is distracting at the end. It doesn't really work. It's not at all like the first exorcism as far as how effective it is because it's you know it's just it doesn't work at all really. Um it turns out that it's the exorcism doesn't work. It's just well whatever that's the end we'll talk about the end later. But anyway, um uh, I, I do like a lot of things about it. I love the dream sequence with all the great cameos in it, and I love um, the astral projection pieces. So we'll, we'll talk some more about that, but there's some things that I think are really neat, but uh, but I wish the end were different. Thank you very much. I mean, I uh, my really quick feeling about it, and, and we should probably just get right into it, without, is that I agree with almost everything that, that – you guys said my other thing that I wanted to point out is this movie has a much different feel from Exorcist 2 it very much captures the even though as Julia points out what this movie really is is a supernatural serial killer movie that just happens to be in the same universe as Exorcist 3 and has a sort of tact on exorcism in the end but basically it's a it's a serial killer movie and and it's a really good one but what I really like is it has that I think it truly qualifies as a prestige horror movie, and I'm trying to create in my head a sort of golden rule for what makes a prestige horror movie. But one thing above all is that a prestige horror movie cannot be hokey. A prestige, you know, you can have a horror movie that's quite expensive and have all the best actors in the world, but if it feels really hokey, then it is no longer prestige because somehow, in my mind, that kicks it out. But this this feels pretty slick all the way through and and really nice. So if, you know, those of us who are upset about the end of the Gothic era in 1973, which got replaced by what I would call the Prestige era, um, this is one of the good ones, you know, and and it, it fits that really well. So, and there are many other ways where this is a movie that captures the feel and the crisis of faith and the cold fear of the first movie um, in ways that the second one just didn't even pretend to have an understanding of. So um, let's get into it. Okay. Now this movie, Exorcist 3, opens up in the beautiful, beautiful Georgetown, which, by the way, is where uh, the lovely Joya went to went to law school. Um, although I think he went on Cap- Georgetown's law building on Capitol Hill, so I don't even know if it ever shows up in any of these. But, <laughs> there, but you digress. But no, but you were there. You were around uh, Washington D.C., so a lot of these will be familiar. Will be familiar scenes to you. Anyway, so I, so I was there, and uh, where were you? Given that we got married during that time period. <laughs> I was also there. I was, I was okay, also, good. I'm lifting myself out. Demon. <laughs> I'm lifting myself out of the narrative. Point is, beautiful place, Georgetown. We get to swoop over it. We get we get to see what it looks like when it's cold in the fall, and the and the the rowing guys are out there doing their crew thing, and and you know the priests are wandering around looking depressed, and and we we get the first glimpses of Father Dyer played by Ed Flanders of St. Elsewhere. His brother of St. Yes, who is, uh, who is a priest who obviously looks, looks kind of down. And then we realize that there has been a murder. A, um, a 12-year-old boy has been killed, 
and we meet Lieutenant uh, Police Lieutenant William Kinderman or George C. Scott, who is investigating. But you have to back up a little. You can't just go go up there because, first of all, there's the whole thing in the church where the locusts all fly into the church and all the papers go flying everywhere, and the Jesus opens his eyes like a Madame Alexander doll that's been propped up. Goodness and, gracious. And, I, the, and then there's that gorgeous shot of the three helicopters against the sun. So there's some really neat yes. things that happen right at the beginning. So, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's all, there's very little – there is some narration, but it's poetic narration. You're basically just seeing a really, really beautiful setup. And I completely forgot about the locusts, but you're right. There is, in this opening, a vision of, of a demonic force kind of coming into the church. And, yes, the – the crucifixes, the big crucifixes' eyes pop open, as you say, like a Madame Alexander Jesus. And that's that's true. Um, and, and and you're right. And then the helicopters. And so immediately, I guess the what's going on here is that we're seeing the modern world with the helicopters and the gr- and the grumbling police lieutenant and the and the dead boy uh, juxtaposed with the church and the priests and the rowers and all of that. All of that traditional stuff that uh, that we have to see, um, you know, throughout Georgetown. And then uh, all that stuff's going on, but at the same time, you have this wonderful little, um, this kind of you know odd couple story of the yes. police, uh, the police officer and the priest. You know, something like the beginning of a joke. You know, so, often a priest go to the movies. Fifteen years after the end. Well, interview. and I was, was going to ask actually. Um, so, Tony, this is one of your favorite characters. Can you tell me what it is? Tell me about the George C. Scott character here, Kinderman. And well, we were kind of talking on the chat, too, that, you know, Lee J. Cobb, who played him, probably had a little bit more of the awkwardness, I think, that especially is in the book. Scott plays it really well, especially now that I've gone back and watched it. But there's a there's a certain offness to his character in the book that for whatever reason I think it's hard it's hard to capture. Um, that I think actor, it was by the way, captured. Died. He had right, died right. And that's why I mean that's why they couldn't yeah. get him. I mean I think, you know, Scott, he he's great in this movie. I mean, he really, really brings it. And, you know, there's through no fault of his own, I think. It's just there's something intangible that is in the book that's hard to explain and the why the rest of the police like when he when he interacts with other cops they're kind of like, uh, Kinderman. Well, A, just because, you know, he was part of this whole exorcist thing. And B, yeah. because of his mannerisms, everybody's like, oh, man, this guy, you know. <laughs> and and there's there's a little bit of that. that you know, I think it comes through more than what I had thought of before, but I think the end of Exorcist 1 really captures it. And yes. it's a shame that, you know, that actor passed before – this movie could be made, even though, you know, if you're going to get somebody else, Scott really nails it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, okay, so but uh, but but his, you know, his manners and his fanaticism with film and just his general like the way he thinks and his kind of inner dialogue is really strange and it's really kind of like I really recommend reading the book. It's it's awesome. Um, I read it, you know, after. I had seen the movie, and I was like, oh, wow, okay, I get it now, you know. It it really kind of reveals a little bit more uh, about the character. I when think we get really later in the, in the story, Tony, I'd love for you to tell us how the book ends. As opposed to oh, the it's been a while. I, I can't remember, yet, really. <laughs> you don't, yeah, don't count on that, because I, I really don't remember <laughs> offhand. I mean, it's been a long time. I do, I can't remember if I bought it or not. I think I was, I mean, I was, it's been a lot of time in and out of the library, so I'm pretty sure I checked it out and read it, like, during the summer once or twice. But, uh, yeah, it's really good. I, I'm, that does prompt me to want to reread it, though, definitely. What I think is interesting about the relationship that we meet early – so, so look, uh, the, these two men were both part of this big incident um, with the possession of Reagan McNeil, however, however many years, 15 years or so earlier – both of them are still haunted by it. And what I think is interesting is that, to be honest with you, it's very unusual. There's a lot of weird things going on here. It's very unusual for a Hollywood movie to show us men who are vulnerable, men who are alone but need company of others. You know, that they, that, 
you know, George C. Scott has a family, and, and he seems to have a fairly fulfilling relationship with his family, the character does. But nevertheless, he needs a friend, you know, and the priest needs a friend, and both of them feel very alone in the world that they're in. And all of that is pretty novel, you know. It's, well, and, and George C. Scott needs to get away from the carp in his bathtub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a really weird thing where apparently his mother-in-law is visiting and is going, and because they're Catholic, one presumes, they're going to have fish on Friday. And so so, for some reason, she needs to get the fish, a, 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 keep the fish alive and buy it early. Yeah, she doesn't want to just buy frozen fish or <laughs> or kill a fish and freeze it. Or get it on Friday. Right. She She's already bought the fish like a, like five or six days early, and it's just <laughs> swimming around the back. Well, wants to get all in impurities out, right? Like, uh, yes. that yeah, that's what he says, the toxins in the blood. Oh, yeah. Oh my Which well, I don't involves know. swimming so, around the bathtub. <laughs> I don't know from hey. carp impurities, so, you know, what? What? maybe maybe there's something to this nut job thing. I, I love seeing this cop's family life. I love it. I love the fact that he has a wife who's, who's you know, cool and, and and that he talks to, and a daughter who's a typical teenager. I mean, all of this is really great characterization. You know, I, I don't know why I was so struck by this, but the fact that he is, he's older, you know, to have a teenage daughter. Because I, I don't know how old George C. Scott is, but, you know, he's got completely white hair. You know, oh, yeah. he's, he's very, he, he looks, he looks older, and yeah. uh, you know, that makes it, um, the, the relationship more interesting to me. Yeah, you know, he was sixty-three. Guy, he was sixty-three. Mm-hmm. Six-three, and so the and this daughter is, let's say, for the sake of argument, sixteen years old. So that means he'd be what sixty-three minus sixteen. Forty-seven. 16. 47 oh wait, sixteen. Is it, um, so forty-four. Yeah. 44. Which is incredibly... No, I said it was 63. It's never mind. Yeah, so it's 47. Oh, I was God, like, 47. A bunch of little arts majors. None of us can do math in our heads. <laughs> you know, oh, it's, it's, that, that, that makes, for some reason, makes the whole family relationship a little bit more huh. interesting to me. I don't know why, but, you know, it's, it's certainly a less conventional Hollywood family. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and even having a guy, George C. Scott's age... You know, it's not just the relationship of, of, you know, the relationship between the two guys. It's the fact that they are older guys. Yeah. And that that's that's such a rarity in and, Hollywood and, movies where we just have, you know, any anybody under the age of thirty just might as well not exist. <laughs> no, you're right? right, and it's not played as a as like a novelty in any sense, other than that these are two very specific people. This is a priest who is depressed. And a and a cop who needs somebody really smart to talk to because he doesn't. Well, also, it. yeah, I mean, in it comes across more in the book. Like everybody else who's he's been around, either is gone, yeah. or just was like, man, I don't really dig hanging out with that guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's right. just well, a weirdo. Have, yeah, they both had have had experiences that they can't explain. Yeah. So, so th- that's that's some uh, inkling into these characters, um, and and what is going on at the beginning is, of course, they're spending time together because they do this in remembrance of their time during Exorcist One, and also uh, they're investigating this new serial killer, uh, this or serial murder, and we come to find out that there have been several crimes that involve a beheading and the replacing of the head with some other head usually of, of religious significance. The boy's head uh, has been replaced with a with uh, a, a crucifix head or a Jesus head from a statue somewhere. The and Jesus head in the same they painted face. in blackface. Yeah. Right. So you know, there's all kinds of racial and uh, and religious stuff going on, and these are some really really grisly crimes. So uh, you know, and the 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 next crime that happens actually come happens to be in the church. So the killer is coming closer to the Catholic church. He literally attacks a priest who is in the middle of hearing a confession. And so well, every time. Sort of. So the, the priest is hearing confessions and this 
quote unquote woman, I guess, comes in, it sounds like a woman, and says, um, you know, kind of begins the conversation and then she says, I've I just have seventeen little things to confess and, and then she starts confessing murders and then the voice Which is changes. A, a very scary story. And then that's when yeah, the priest is then killed, but we don't see that. That's off awesome. what I like one of the things I like about the film is that the killings happen off screen, which I think is I, I don't personally like gory movies, so I, I like that right. there's not really a lot of gore in this film at well, all. Well killings happen off screen in the version we saw. I don't know. There might be a, a grisly version. Well I think like I mean, there's they do they do a pretty good job of straddling the line of what's and that's what makes good horror. I, I think a lot of times when it's, I mean, there's there's good gore movies, and you know we talked about this before. Like, I, you know, if, if I'm gonna see a gory movie, I want it to be, super, you know, a great gory movie. But I think still the old thing of whatever you can imagine is far more horrific than what usually what you can show has a lot to it, especially in a psychological horror like this. Yeah. And and cool. that, that, I mean, I think that makes a, a big difference. And one thing that's also that you're dealing with in this, which makes it interesting, is in a lot of times, you know, you have, especially like, say, The Exorcist, right? You have a, a cross does something, a holy water does something. Whereas here, you have a demon that can walk into a church yeah. Behead a statue, kill a priest. Yeah, nothing you know, about holy, like, gra- holy, there's holy. There's nothing. Demons. There's nothing sacred to this no. creature, this being, because of what it can do, and that makes it even more scary and more like, wow, what do you do with this thing? Because By the it way, can go anywhere, uh, and that's that's, that's truly terrifying. Yes. Before we get away you from the, the church thing, I want to tell you that the, the the person whose voice that is, by the way, is actually George C. Scott's then wife. Ah, is a person oh, wow. the, the killer. Hmm. Yeah. You know, you know the the thing about the the gore also, because the first the first Exorcist is such an in your face movie when you really think about it. Sure. You know this if they had actually showed what the killer is doing, you know, because we we get the descriptions and of what the the aftermath of these very. Yeah, he has metal ink murder, murder thing. Yeah, if you had shown yeah. that, the the censors would have had a field day oh, for yeah, this yeah. movie. And I'm sure they were already sharpening their knives when they heard Exorcist Three. Mm. Maybe. I mean, it's it's it, the thing is with Exorcist Two being such a bonkers film. You know, who knows what? You know, the worst. You can't get much more than R rating than an R rating in 1990. I mean, because there's some pretty grisly. Yeah, they had NC-17 by then. That's yeah, no, it's true. That's or they true. could have just made it go unrated. Yeah. And believe no, me, they had showed somebody decapitating a twelve year old and replacing its For his sure. head with a, a Jesus, Jesus statue in blackface. Like yeah. b- believe me, that's a, that's that's an unrated movie there. <laughs> but those yeah. are the, those are the first two killings and, and what, what it, I just wanted to say what's really interesting, uh, before we get to what happens next is Father Dyer re- really talks about religion and its purpose in this movie in a way that the second movie, which we have to reckon with because it's part of the series, okay? The second movie never really understood a damn thing about what exactly religion tries to do other than in a political sense. In the second movie, there's this whole notion of the church as a political body trying to justify itself. But in the first movie and in this movie, the priests are really there to grapple with. The world does dark things. The the you know the Christ often does not wield magic. How do we grapple with the terrible things we are beset with? You know, and that's fascinating. I mean, it's really interesting to see these guys um, walking around this extremely dismal, gray, cold Washington D.C., dealing with these horrible crimes and trying to grapple with what is it to have faith that there is something greater. There is a there is you know, there's uh, a, a higher power that is there to comfort me. And that's, you know, that is the kind of at least question that the second movie just would never, would never even have dawned on it to, to talk about. It. Um, and then that guy dies. Bri- uh, Father Dyer. Um, well, you have to talk about that dream sequence because the way we learn, because we really <laughs> like that kid. By the time he dies, like, and this is the reason what, 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 really sets this apart from a lot of other movies that were coming out at this time period 
is you really like that priest. So when yeah. you, yeah. you learn that he is dead, you're, you're, you know, you're like, oh, you know, you're, you're upset about that. You know, like, oh, you absolutely. like that. Well, yeah, so, so you're right. So let's talk about the dream sequence because I just loved the dream sequence. First of all, it's got this mess of uh, cameos. And, and I was just reading, I, hadn't even, I had seen the Fabio cameo as one of the angels, but I had not noticed from reading it that Samuel L. Jackson is in there as a blind man and Patrick Ewing is another angel. But it's all these fantastic images of, like, of angels and all kinds of bizarre things. And there's this weird Joker statue. Yes. It's, well, the Joker it's, statue comes later. That's in that dream, though. No, it's no, not. It's, it's, the Joker it's, it's statue later in the movie. movie. It's uh, it's not a dream. The Joker statue is really there. It's just only on screen. Oh, you're, you're right. That's later in the hunting. No, okay, you're right. But anyway, but the, I don't know if you guys want to talk more about what you remember about the dream. I just remember it being freaky. There are, yeah, I mean, he has a dream at the same time that something horrible is happening. He has dreams where he's in a great way station haunted by uh, angels, blind people, chihuahuas, little black boys. And well, it's the little boy that died. Yes. Yes, it is a little boy that died, and he has a stitch up, stitched up neck. And then um, he has a vision of Father Dyer. And he says, "We're we're both are we both dreaming this?" And he says, "I'm not dreaming." And um, clearly, he's got a, a, his neck has been stitched together as it's well. It's so horrible. And and yeah, it's a vision of Father Dyer um, uh, being attacked, having a sort of a, a spasm or a, or a seizure of some kind. And then he is awakened by a phone call saying that his friend has been killed. And he goes to the hospital. I, Dyer was in there, I think, just for some some minor issue, like a heart palpitation or something, you know, just something minor. There was no reason to think he was going to die. But, no, he's been murdered, and it's this really wackadoo crime where the serial killer, who he suspects is exactly the same person as did the previous two murders, has now killed his friend and completely exsanguinated him. Yeah, you know. Very neatly, and puts all the blood into these little bitty jars. Yes. He, Dr. Fives kills him. Yes, yeah. that's right. I forgot it. Yeah, Dr. Fives did this. Yes. So he, he exsanguinates, uh, you know, Father Dyer, puts them all into little jars, and um, now George C. Scott is convinced serial killer's on the loose. He's gotten these three people, and then he finds something bad. He well, learns the the fingerprints for these three people do not match. Right, but also don't forget he also painted on the wall. The person painted the only blood was yes. on the wall. Well, that's that he he paints it's a wonderful life that the murderer he, and that's the movie that he's got. With two L's. With two L's. Right. And so all of these are telltale signs of this guy called the Gemini Killer. The problem is the Gemini Killer has been dead for about ten years. So you know, in his mind, you have to think. You know, maybe he thinks, okay, this is some kind of crazy copycat, somebody who somehow was so close to the Gemini killer that he knew all of his secrets because the alternative is the Gemini killer has come back to life. But there is yet another problem, and that's that all the evidence shows that these three murders were committed by three different people. And that's a that's a major problem. And it can't be a copycat that doesn't know him well because the stuff that that the that the murders the the, the, the little um you know, like you said, the telltale signs of the murders are all things that weren't covered in the press. Yes. Right. Or so, or read were it were red herrings to the press. Yeah, they were covered in weird out. Right. Yeah, exactly. to weed out people who were copycats, who were said they were copycats anyway, right. or said they were the person. The cuckoos. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is truly, at this point, here's what I like about it. This is a serial killer movie. Yeah, based <laughs> on Zodiac, by the way. <laughs> yes. The actual Zodiac killer. It's Je- this is Jeffrey Dahmer's favorite movie. Really? Was. Mm-hmm. Well, that's something to put on your tombstone. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty... Um, so yeah, um, it, it is. It's a serial. Killer, it's a it's a supernatural serial killer movie. If it were any other thing, not The Exorcist, you would think, okay, at the end, there's either going to be a really interesting scientific explanation for how this is being done, you know, or sci- not scientific, but Scooby Doo esque, where you know somehow a big conspiracy has done this, or there will be a supernatural explanation. But regardless, this is not an Exorcist movie. It's just a movie that happens to be in the same universe, and. And the only reason it's in the same universe is because uh, these two men were connected to Father Karras right. 15 years ago when all the extra stuff happened, and then eventually Father Karras will become a, a, a key part of this. But um, there's nothing else that makes it 
you know, an exorcist movie. Until and that it, actually yeah. happens now because uh, George C. Scott starts to investigate in the hospital where his friend was killed. And what he finds is um, a, a, a complete shock to him. There is a guy down below who has been there for 15 years and is in, like, solitary confinement, who is the spitting image of Father, <laughs> Father Damien Karras, the, uh, the priest who had been in Exorcist Number 1. And this is really a surprise to us. You know, it's, it's, uh, I have to say, by the way, the whole movie is really, really well directed, and there are a lot of really interesting tricks and really interesting effects. But I was disturbed by this. I felt like this was a weird cut. This was a weird one to me. And it was, and it was weird for the director. I mean, he didn't want to do that either, but, the, 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 again, the studio was like. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying Jason. No, no, no. Father Karras was supposed to be in there. I'm just saying. But not that, the actor. Not the actor. No, he he was. They they wanted the studio wanted to bring um, Miller back as uh, to into the movie Jason Miller back, and so they had to because they had already started filming with Brad Dourif, and so he had to um, uh, go ahead and figure out a way to. Do, he didn't want to get rid of the Dourif stuff, answer. so he had to use both. So what he ends up doing is having um, Jason Miller in whenever the detective is is seeing him from his perspective, and then whenever you're just seeing him from the actual Gemini killer's perspective, uh, you know, like when you're seeing Ge- the Gemini killer persona, then you see Brad Dourif. But that was all because they just wanted a link, another link. What's it like in the book? Like, do what, they have like, that sort of weird duality in the book? Um, Man, it's been so long. I feel I should have I should have read it this week or whatever, but it was I was super busy. That's okay. But yeah, well, but, yeah, um, the Karis is supposed to be because the idea was that yes, the Karis Karis's body is being used for this now you know this this the whatever mind soul whatever you want to call it of the Gemini killer. He is using Karis's body. He's possessed Karis's body after his after the after yeah the no died. I, I, I get but I get that. What I'm saying I is just, they weren't going to use they were just going to use Dorif and just have it be like pretend I don't know. But anyway, the point is that they made him use Jason Miller. I I like I I, I you know like knowing that I mean I guess it's kind of weirdly edited, but I don't know I like that and it makes sense because like Father Karis is like at the end of the original Exorcist, goes, take me, take me. So, I mean, it does kind of tie into all of that. I, I I thought that, man, you know, as much as he may not have liked it, I thought that was a great, uh, I just think it's well, really well edited. I thought it was really creepy that he, you know, he goes down there and he sees him. And I get the impression he actually, you know, kind of catches him like, whoa, now I'm seeing, you know, the Gemini killer. Like, yeah. I'm not even sure if there's a, yeah, I, I never I would have questioned it him, like uh, that way because, and that's what's even creepier, like this idea I never would have that he became this now. Now. Well, what's funny is everybody else in the hospital. You have to imagine everybody else in the hospital sees Jason Miller all the time. Yeah, sure. And just, exactly. to, just to recap for no, the no, I audience. think I think I think that the detective only sees Jason Miller. I think we're the only no, ones no, no. that see Brad Dourif. Body, I don't think so. Brad Dourif. So let's let's skip to the, the explanation for. For this, uh, so here's what happened, and and this is also for the audience in case we've been talking in circles and you don't get it so far. All right, remember Jason Miller fell to his death and bashed his brains in at the end of Exorcist One, and what we learn, and meanwhile, in another state, a guy named the Gemini Killer was being killed, and he would have looked like Brad Dourif, uh, who was the lovable the lovable schlub in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So what happens? My uh, heck, he's Chucky. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. Well, I didn't know that. but uh, <laughs> And, Jason, there is actually, there is an alternate, one of the scenes that you mentioned in your opening that is that was cut and that disappeared is actually an alternate is opening scene where Kinderman f- views the body of Karis in the morgue after the fall of the stairs and then leaves the morgue and the heart monitor shows signs of life from the body of Karis. Okay, okay, okay. So that's me, all part of the Let me do this in like story. 10 seconds so that we don't lose the plot. I just, like really quickly. All right. Karis dies, bat, skulls bashed in, and then uh, serial killer Gemini gets killed. The devil 
takes the soul of the Gemini killer, shoves it into the busted up body of Father Karras, which crawls out of the morgue and then spends 15 years rebuilding its brain so the devil can use it to be a serial killer. That's the idea. So it is Jason Miller's body. It is Father Karras's body right. that everybody sees. But he will never, but I'm telling you that Kinderman will never see Doris at all. Because remember, he actually is looking at the pictures when he's reading, when he's reading about um, this killer. He's looking at the pictures. He doesn't like, he doesn't make any kind of face like, oh my gosh, I've seen this guy. And he does, I don't think he ever registers that they're different people that he's looking at. It's always I, just, he knows that Doris personality is inside of Karis. I don't think he ever sees I don't know if he's going like, back and forth. No, he Sorry. noticed, like, there's a, when they make the switch, Scott like looks at him like, whoa! Like there's yes. a there's a visible change in his expression as far as like, holy crap! I'm seeing the Gemini killer. I don't know, like yeah. I, I don't think I'm crazy. And, and uh, like he he definitely has a, I am now talking to the Gemini killer. Like I am looking at the Gemini killer. Uh, All right. Look yeah. and whether you know, yeah, okay, that's you know he didn't they didn't mean it that way, but I think there's. I think they shot it that way once they had to, and I think it works really well. I think it makes it creepier, too. I mean, because, it's, I, know, I, I think it's delightful. I mean, I, I have no problem with this stuff so far. Yeah. I mean, the, so far, this is this is still just fine. And, I, by the way, the weird cut I was talking about is when George C. Scott actually looks in the room the first time, there is a very abrupt cut to George C. Scott walking into the uh, hospital administrator's office and he says, I think that guy down there is the Gemini killer. I'm just saying that the cut is so weird and jagged, it feels it feels screwed with in some way. You know, it doesn't it doesn't at all feel as, as smooth and careful as the rest of the work that Vladdy's doing in, mm-hmm. in, in the Man and uh, his when he does the crazy like demon howl. Yeah. Just the 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 way that he personifies the demon is really, really slash the Gemini killer because it's Legion. So there's there's yeah. a lot of things in there. You know, he says, "Hey, you know," they kind of acknowledge that it's not it's not just him kind of hanging out. He's the main one, but there's all the other people kind of there's the Legion kind of broiling in there. When he yeah. does that oh. demon howl, oh man, that is mm-hmm. that's horror. Yeah, this is you know? Brad Dourif. And then he and then he's and then he's so happy, like you know, hey. I'm pretty good at that, right? Like well, the way changed, he says voice it. changes back and forth so much. At first, I thought he was being dubbed, and I'm like, no, I guess it's just him just doing oh, his voice. Oh, it's so good. It's that. Yeah. That scene, and and that's what I, makes a lot of this so so fantastic as a horror movie because well, the interplay between really whenever the they put half hour of the movie, whenever Brad they put characters of, together, you yeah. know, but we have they to have back these up. great conversations. We have to back up before we go to the end because you got you've been, you haven't even talked about the old people yet. It's so funny because when he's first in the hospital and he goes into um, Kinderman goes into the this room with all these sort of um, um, it's not just old people. It's like catatonic people and people that are just kind of off kilter a little bit. And um, and then later on he goes into the quote unquote disturbed ward. And I was like, well, what the heck was that? <laughs> that was the disturbed yeah. ward. But those guys uh, have all this creepy stuff going on where a couple of them are, like, having conversations with imaginary phones and radio, uh, real radios. And so there's clearly something going on there. And, um, and that's all part of, of this whole thing. And so uh, I just didn't want to get – I don't want you to skip all over that because that's part of the creepy, especially the creepiest scene to me in the whole movie is this wonderful scene, and that, that, that's happened later on, where one of the old people... Um... Oh, no, that fits into where we are now. Okay. So, yeah, because it, basically what what we're learning right now, the movie flips and moves towards its supernatural explanation of how these serial killers are being, do, being done. How can three different people do it? It's easy. The devil, you know, a demonic force is possessing different people to go and do these, these evil deeds. Yes, yeah, astral projection from the... Yeah, so I'm just going out and the people who are susceptible. Right. He's going so out because the, the body is going to sleep. The people are more susceptible. Yeah. yeah. The catatonic people And the body is going to sleep, but the, but the brain activity is getting is getting more active. Yes. And and so we meet these women, for instance, who are who are senile, 
who, are, who think already that they're hearing demonic voices from their radios. And these are the perfect, the perfect people for another, uh, you know, for another patient in the hospital to take over and walk them out of the hospital and go commit murders. It's brilliant. I mean, that's, that's really pretty cool. I mean, uh, you know, and serial killer movies always really have to accomplish like a couple things. They've got to tell us wh- who's doing it and why are they doing it. So the who is the guy down there, down below, who goes catatonic and takes over other people's body. The why is very simple. It's, it's uh, the demon from Exorcist 1 wants to get revenge for, um, for the exorcism. No, but that's not what I mean. It's just the serial. Like we don't even know the demon thing is just because they're trying to connect it to the extras. But really, no, it's this the much, serial killer. I'm pretty sure this much was actually is actually. Uh, yeah, they do the have that problem. line. Yeah. But to me, that again, I think that might be part of the whole rewrite to tie it into. Well, the no, movie. I mean the movie. Because the, 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 even the book is a sequel the book to is the Exorcist. Legion. Yeah, the book yeah. is Legion. There's a bunch of demons. They reference okay. the Bible, which he says. You know, we are legion. We, there's a bunch of demons possessing somebody. It's not just yeah. one demon. It's not Pazuzu. It's no, no, many but, demons but, as legion. But it's also that serial killer. It's the of course. Killer. One, but one of the demons that's inside him, which happens yeah. to be the main one, but that's that's the whole... Okay, right. Yeah, because yeah, he does say we are, I am many. I am one. I am no one. I am many, he says. Yeah. yeah. It's the quote yeah. from the Bible that is the actual name of the book there, legion. Like, yeah, it was one of the demons that Jesus cast out. He, he yeah, goes, Who are it's you? many, goes, it's many of them. Me? And the, you know, he talks about, hey, you know, the father's down here too. He's, you know, he's in hell. He's in here. He's being yeah. tormented. We see him from time to time. That kind of, that, and that's part of the taunt. But well, and he he's the one who true. saves the day at the end. Yeah, but remember okay. that that uh, now that's interesting. This is one where it deviates from the first one because Father. Um, uh, Father Marin in the first movie said, "Listen, fuck that noise. There's only one of them. That everything he says about there's somebody else in here. There's other other souls. He lies. That's just it. Lies. It uses right. a psychological attack. But in this case, it looks like Father Karras is actually still kind of in there. But that's because the brain's not but dead. There's... Aha. Yes. That's because yeah. he's not actually dead. Sorry. Now I understand. That's yeah. Well, there's true. there's no." They try to tack in in like an equivalent of the Father Marin character, but there really, you know, there is no character like that. In oh God, yeah. So movie. let's talk about this. So far, everything we've talked about makes this a fantastic film. Now, <laughs> well, and talk about the creepy, the creepy scene that I was about to talk about when you said that. Oh no, go ahead if you like. Uh, this is. A, I this just is think a it's of... the creepy. That, to me, this movie is actually not that scary at all, mm-hmm. and there's really not that much. It's 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 interesting, but I wouldn't say there's even that much. That's Super creepy, but that one scene at one point, the uh, detective is standing in that room with all the old people, and uh, and this one woman um, suddenly is like looking through the, the closet door or whatever, and suddenly you see her from outside. It's, like, it's one camera shot, completely quiet. From outside this glass wall, you see her appear on the ceiling, and she's crawling upside down like. You know, Spider Pig style, yes. <laughs> Spider Man style, across the ceiling and around over his the detective's head and then off to the right of the screen. Oh, uh, I love so that scene so creepy. much. It's so yeah, it creepy. Is. It is so effective. It is very effective. So creepy. Just so that's one of the few things effect. in the film up to, up until that point that is truly supernatural because everything else. It's just kind of weird, you know. But oh, and she not, even not really... she even mugs for the camera. They yeah. do this great scene where she turns and she has this this like she's already kind of crazy looking yeah. when you first meet her, but she's really you get you get the sense of malice when she mugs at the right. camera, and yeah. the sense of glee of like, haha, I'm fooling everybody when I'm doing this, <laughs> and that 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 whole thing about what demons are and how they mess with people, and you know, kind of goes back a little bit to Reagan and what, you know, what she did, but this, you know, turns to the camera and it's just like this, you know, this is the things I kind of, I do. And, oh man. But, you know, also one of, they do a lot of great old school stuff. There's the setup of the, of the nurse who gets attacked. Yeah. is just amazing. Cause the door opens. You're like, Oh, that's going to be the serial killer. She goes, she checks on it. It's not. 
And they just keep <laughs> showing it. They're the same shot down the hallway. <laughs> well, it's so and fantastic because there there's multiple doors. Yeah. You know, the, the security guards come and they leave and she scream. You know, things happen. And, you know, she's scared. And you're like, huh, well, I know something has to happen. Well, there's a and then the when the doctor kind white of gets so comes old. just walk and they do like the orchestra hit and it's just the whole all of it the jump scare thing oh man it, but it's a very effective old school trick like how long can you string people along uh-huh, how I many bet. times can you kind of like is that oh that's not it uh uh and they kiss keep you on the like just on the edge of your seat until the payoff which is just like holy crap that's Describe cool it. Cool and awful, you know. Yeah, you have to describe the payoff if you're going to say that. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I said there's a figure in white appears with the, the giant, uh, you know, surgical scissor implement. Yeah. And yeah. Just runs, it just kind of follows you know, her off screen. In, a, in, the, in the way that uh, the purposefulness of uh, Michael Myers, except yeah. in a sheet, you know, and the, a the whole... that is just walking, like, as fast as they can, yeah. you know. You know, and you kind of you gotta wonder, like actually, like what the hell happened to that security guard that was just there? Isn't he like kind of just? Well, he well, was probably he, checking. He could he be went down the hall. Yeah, yeah, he went down the hall and he's checking other things. And what's great is this entire scene is shot from a distance, also in, in a hallway, looking down at this one sort of intersection where the the waiting, you know, the front desk is, where there's another set of double doors going to other halls. Where there's some patients. Yeah, it's so reminiscent of Halloween because it's that nighttime. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Is so Although cool. Halloween two never had a single shot as cool no. as this as no. this scene we're talking about. No, and it's so effective and it's very old school and creepy. No, Just, it's very good. I mean, that is that is some masterful suspense. The way yeah. that it builds, like other horror directors wish they could build, like. You really, this is one of those that really separates people from understanding, who really understand horror and suspense. When you can build a scene like that, and it doesn't, it harkens to a lot of things, but for some reason, it still seems relatively new. You know, it's, it's got to feel, oh, I've seen this a million times, yeah. but it's still surprising every time I see it, and it's still, you know, get your blood pumping and you're on your edge of your seat or your couch or whatever, you know, yeah. it's, man, it's just so good. And there's so many bits like that in this movie that really makes it just separates it from, you know, there's been other psychological horror movies, you know, some of them have dream sequence, et cetera. But at each stage, this tops most of the movies in this genre and that are built similarly. And you know, there's there's something to it. That's it's really amazing. Oh, I agree completely. And it's really also it tells you what you know how a movie can go so right or so wrong. I was gonna say in the hands of a great director, but even great directors sometimes can go horribly wrong. This movie's going right. However, there's an interesting thing going on also, and it's because of the, they at, they forced William Peter Blatty to add in a whole subplot. So all through the movie, we keep cutting back to another character. It's very much like the way they keep cutting back to the Scott Glenn character in The Keep, where you keep cutting back to this guy who is meditating and is just waiting for demons to show up so he can fight them. He right. is a another exorcist, another disciple of, of Father Marin, we can presume. He is Nicole uh it's it's Nicole Williamson, right? Um Yeah. Yes. Uh who I'm trying to think. I I know Nicole Williamson from um Dick's Caliber, but hmm. uh, and also I think he was in one of the Tales from the Crypt movies. But uh, here he plays Father Morning. Yes, Father Morning, who is you know lives his very simple sort of ascetic life as a priest, and they just keep cutting back to him because it's the only thing Blatty can do to sort of crudely make us aware. Hey, later on. Father Morning is going to show up, so I want you guys to at least know that that, that he exists. Because um, what happens later is, you know, we George C. Scott figures out, aha, it is the possess, it is the body of Father Karras, and he's possessed. And then we begin a long. The the rest of the movie is made up of mostly the interview with with uh, Brad Dourif, which we talked about how Dourif is brilliant. He's just fantastic. 
as as the serial killer here. And we touched on it a lot, but if there's anything else that you guys would like to mention about his performance here, um, you're, you're well, welcome. I, I really do love his insanity and his glee at how he does his work. It's like yeah, it, like at one point it's like somewhere between like... Hannibal Lecter and Beetlejuice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I really would have liked to have seen Brad Dorff play the Joker when he was around this age. You know, there ah, is a lot of Joker now. That would have been really yeah. good, yeah. I mean, you're, you're right. I, it does make me think of the Joker. You know, the, the sort of the taunting, the, the, in a way, a kind of a sense of innocence about how evil he is. You know, that, that it is an acceptable way to be. I mean, he's, he's an insane person, and it's, he, he does a really, really good job. He, he does. Well, yeah. It's Drunk. funny. I've seen him play uh, Chucky, like in the pre, in his pre doll stage, <laughs> and you know who is also a serial killer. And it's you'd think that he would play exactly the same way, but this is a guy that's played two serial killers and played them completely different. And because the the Charles Lee Ray character is very sort of you know blue collar, more of a you know a rock and roll type personality, you know, very, you know, kind of F you, F the world kind of thing. It, it has nothing of the, the the verbal sophistication that we, we see here with the, with the Gemini killer. Yes. No, yeah. a- absolutely. Although I, I never saw the Chucky stuff. I, I, I know I should have. Maybe someday we need to. They're do fun. You should, you, you'd like them. I've, I've no, I have no doubt. I, I kind of feel bad that I never, that I never saw them. Well, we'll um, do, we'll do a retrospective. Well, you'll. I have no doubt that we will. will. I mean, if we do it, I think we should do the whole thing, you know, all the way to Meg, all the way to Jennifer Tilly. I almost said Meg Tilly. Sorry. Jennifer Tilly and beyond. <laughs> okay. Yes. There. Um. So so yeah, I we really. This is like a speech that you don't actually want to read because you want people to hear how the actor does it. He's really good. If you watch the movie for nothing else, watch it for the wonderful performance of Brad Dourif, who never moves from a single chair and does a fantastic job. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you want, now that I think about it, if you want a really creepy monologue to uh, go to an audition with, here's the one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you could probably just grab any random 90 seconds from uh, from from his roughly 20 minutes of jabbering at, uh, at George C. Scott. Where he describes, where he describes exsanguinating someone. Oh, and George C. Scott wanna... just spends the whole thing just sitting there staring at him. It's wonderful. It's it's really it's really fantastic. Anyway, as that's going on, um, uh, we uh, basically. The priest, oh, well, okay, two things happen. The Gemini killer, Brad Doris, sends one more demon-possessed old lady, the one who crawled away, to attack George C. Scott's family. Um, that does not work out. Uh, well, and also, I mean, they're able to call, whoever, I guess, I don't know how that works, call his wife and say, as, as, as him, as the, as the detective, Yes. Um, and so she she thinks she's talking to her husband. She's like, oh, this Bill. He's sending over a nurse with a package. So, I mean, that's yet another skill that apparently Stephen has is to somehow make phone calls. And Listen, use if Wonder Woman well, he can, and the Terminator can do it, then, mm-hmm. then the devil Well, he also shows that he has this really angelic voice, like he sings. Yeah. In a way that, that harkens back to, the, you know, a lot of the demons being cast yeah. out angels. And so that they would have these angelic voices regardless, um, you know, which, again, you know, that's one of those things like, oh, man, demons make this because, you know, that's rock and roll and that kind of thing. Like, you know, performing arts, um, you know, popular music. Oh, man, it's, it's demonic because it can be so seductive and, you know, or pure or, you know, and this has that. It has this, you know, angelic voice. It just starts singing. And it yeah. really, you know, fits in with the lore of demons, especially those, you know, cast out from heaven. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Really, really. I mean, the the sound design and the way they do all these things, you know, and juxtapose that with the horrible, you know, demon growl that he does, you know, minutes before. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's just a lot of stuff, a lot of great stuff going on. Um, so he, he sends yeah. over his minion or whatever mm-hmm. like he possesses the woman 
And so she goes over there, but he's um, he's hot on the trail, the te- detective is, because yeah. he's figured it out because of, what was the clue that led him to Julie? Was the nurse, his name was Julie, and I don't know. His well, daughter's he, name he, is Julie. Just, yeah, it, it's that he remembers that the demon says, you know what, I'm sick of you, you're personally taunting me, and so you're putting yourself in the path. And so yeah, well, for, he, so he, he knows, sees the the nurse's name is Julie, and he decides, oh, my daughter's name is Julie. I better go home. So he goes, he takes off, and it's this car. I mean, not car chase exactly because they're not, it's not behind it. But the point is, you're seeing the two cars, and they're getting trying to get to the house. So he gets home, and everything seems to be fine. And so she's like, what's the story? His wife says, what's the story with this nurse that you sent us? And she's just, the old lady's just sitting there at the table. Yeah, she snapped out of it. And she's so confused of why she's there. So it seems like every, all will be fine, except that. The reason she snapped out of it is because Father Morning has finally shown up. In the, right. uh, in no, the no, 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 no. That's not no, why. That's, that's yep. not why. At that point, no. At that point, there's. It's uh, because the demon wanted to wait. Because the demon actually possesses her again and says, "I was waiting for you because I wanted you to see this." And oh. pulls out the big, giant, head-topping shears. I don't know why they have okay, those. Okay, I stand corrected. The, the head-topping head. shears. Well, they're, 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 they're from the. They're from the mortuary. Yeah, they're from, from the, the mortuary. Morgue. Goes to cut Julie's his daughter's head off, and somehow I didn't exactly catch who pushed her out of the way but somehow she's saved barely and it's a really quite a powerful shot actually and um and then and that's when the priest shows up so that the only reason that um that the demon isn't able to continue this this you know deathly attack is that the father morning shows up in the cell and and puts a pause to us and the movie wraps up pretty quickly from there because father morning starts an exorcism um he's doing all kinds of exorcist kind of stuff and then the demon, oh, it's awful. The demon really tears him apart. Yeah. And, uh, but that gives George, George C. Scott time to get there. And in a brief moment of weakness, when Father Karras manages to snap out of his demon possession, because one can presume the demon himself is tired too, in the way that Reagan possessed would get tired. Father Karras snaps out of his demon possession and says, now, now, shoot me now. And George C. Scott shoots uh, well, that's the okay. only utility that Father Morning has, is that he manages to wake up from his almost dead state and say, Karis, fight! <laughs> yeah, that Father, that, right, that's correct. That's so right. it's only it's always Father Karis. It's not, the, the, the exorcism had no effect. It was only Father Karis fighting the demon from within I, that I, has the effect. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with you. I mean, William Peter Blatty certainly didn't think this this character or this uh, exorcism was necessary. Well, they try to give that character a kind of mystique, and they just fail completely (laughs) in doing so. Well, that's why I don't know what the end of the book is. At the end of the book, does Karis defeat the the possession himself? Because I know there's not an exorcism. No, according to the Wikipedia, um, Karis uh, snaps out of it, and Kinderman shoots him in the head. Right, in the book. Yes. So, yeah, so Karis is always that's, the that's one who saves. That's why Wikipedia says, if, if it's wrong, we'll find out because we'll take a look at it. Yeah, Karis is always the one who saves the day, and the exorcism is completely incidental and not and not necessary at all. Yeah. 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 It's, it's between that's, Karis and Kinderman. Right. So there's no That's extra. fine. And they do get crazy. I mean, on, on rewatch, I was like, I'd forgotten, you know, there's lightning. <laughs> Book starring and there's like people there's around. There's way like, more there's special like, effects in that than there is in even the original Exorcist for the Exorcism. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I don't know. We'll have to find out like what actually happens in the novel, but we know that Blatty, when he wrote this movie, and in fact the first time he shot it, there is just pretty much everything you see that happens between George C. Scott and Father Karras happens, including the killing. And that's how it ends. And there's just not this extra priest character. But can we watch this movie? Now, that's the whole movie. Here's the question. Can we forgive the movie for this stupid edition? In other words, does it so fatally flaw it that we can't recommend it? Or can you just go, uh, you know, the priest is kind of tacked on, but, but I'm all right with it. The, the, you know, in other words, where do we, where do we fall? Is it, is it a you know, fatal flaw? I, I think, you know, it's not. It is a little disappointing, and you know, Jen Art in the in the uh, chat room, you know, talked about well, there's that beacon beacon of light, and you know, there's there's something else, you know, 
an, a holy attribute to this, like that you know shows him the cross and that kind of thing. Um, it is a little bit kind of out of nowhere and ham-fisted, perhaps, to kind yeah. of call it to attention, like, hey, look. Uh, or maybe it was just a way to say, hey, well, in the first one, we wanted this rise of Father Karras. They go back to that time and time again, especially in the uh, extras. Um, maybe, you know, we need to do something that redeems Father Karras in addition to him snapping out of it. And, you yeah. know, it just depends. I mean, who knows other than if they make a really good, you know, documentary. Supposedly it's coming out on Blu-ray, which I am pretty excited about. But, um, you know, we'll see. And, you well, what know, right, there's another, there's something else in the cell. You know, there's there's a there's a holy presence as well that comes out. Um, yeah. Again, you know, it's in the form of a spotlight and a cross, and et cetera. But it gets really wacky. I, You know, I think it... it I think you can forgive it because the rest of the movie is good and perhaps it wasn't the fault of the director as far as adding this. But it's it does it is a little weird. I, I, like I really it, don't I don't think it's an embarrassing addition. I just feel like it's no, no. not necessary. You know. Exactly. It's not hokey. It's not like the heart massaging, um, crazy dream sinking thing going on in Exorcist Two and yeah. it's light years from that. It's just you just could do without it. it you know, it, it feels right. it feels just added on. Um, yeah, and Blatty regretted it himself. He said, I did shoot them because I, the last thing I wanted was for them to hire another director <laughs> to come right. in and, and paint uh, and, and create this new scene and tack it in. He's like, you don't want that. It's like, I'd rather do it under protest than, than have somebody else. And, and i got to admit, that is totally, totally true. You know, well, you know, that sometimes that happens, definitely. It happens a lot. Yeah. Superman 2 is totally plagued with stuff like that, with two different directors, you know, cramming scenes in on top of on top of other uh, scenes. Well, also, you know, it does – I think the other thing that it does is it does take away from – if you have a, an extra priest character who comes out of nowhere and doesn't – you know, tries to do an exorcism, it does take away from – you know, the Kinderman character being a detective. Like, a lot of this is based on his, he's a weirdo, but he's still a good detective, and people respect that. And so where he's putting all this stuff together and and having to deal with the fact that part of it is supernatural, you know, against yeah. modern, like, you know, you have all this stuff that's like, hey, this is solid detective work, except for the fact that Demon can body hop and stuff, and you have to deal with that. In addition yeah. to, you know, because he's seen this other stuff, and that's, you know, Exorcist 1 still, prepared him for that. Detective brain. He, he did, you know, he was the one who figured out, I need to go talk to that guy down there. You know, yeah, yeah. Hey, All that stuff so, is great. You know, and, yeah. you know, you want him, he doesn't need, he doesn't need this ex, extra Exorcist character. <laughs> right. You know. I love his fighting with the nurse, by the way. There's a really <laughs> neat ongoing thing where there's this nurse who is, just preternaturally calm and annoying in how calm she is. And so whereas he is pretty calm with everybody, he just yells at her all the time because he just he just finds her infuriating where where, you know, she'll everything he asks, she'll go, Well, do you mean, you know, um two o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock in in the morning and, and he'll be I mean in the afternoon <laughs> or whatever. He'll just yell and, out of nowhere. And I, I totally I mean I identify I don't like randomly scream at nurses generally. But I completely identified with his just constant, whenever he was encountered, this one person, he would just start pounding his hand and screaming at her. Um, I, well, know, yeah, I also that that older nurse, man, she's just like so crotchety and old, like old school nurse, you know. Yeah, I'm talking about the chain-smoking that, nurse who, who yeah. actually ends up giving him most of the information because she isn't. Isn't evil in any sense. She's just this annoying yeah. person. She becomes like almost one of his pals, although she does get iced by the demon, so that's a shame. Yeah. Because um, she has, in a sense, the same crotchety attitude towards him that Father Dyer did, which which I think he has some appreciation for. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean you believe she's believable. She's believable as that nurse character because if you, especially oh, yeah. there's that old school kind of like. Look, I'm doing my job. I'm a nurse. I've been doing this, and like, yeah. <laughs> but and you see that, like, you know, she's very real. Um, if you ever met, you know, I've met that person. <laughs> you yeah. 
like, and you've seen her in, you know, analogs of her in other movies where the people try to tell her, like, well, have you done this? And she's like, look, you know, I probably know more than the doctors because yes. I actually do the work, you know, <laughs> kind of person. And and you, you, you can respect that. But she's also really, like, cantankerous and crotchety, kind of a jerk sometimes yes. because that's, you know, that's the way, that's the kind of character she is. But she's really... Man, there's just so many really good, solid performances. Yeah. Oh, man. Which is funny. Again, we had really good actors in the last movie, and yet you had no good performances. And, and Yes. So maybe that's the director. Maybe maybe well, there's an alchemy that, of all kinds of things. But regardless, you know. You know, there's a lot. There's a decent amount of movies. There's a decent amount of movies where you see, um, you know, you're you're like wow these people have won all kinds of awards and have been in other stuff I like. At that point, you can't really blame the actor. Yes. If you got to kind of look at the director. <laughs> yeah. So, no, that's right. Yeah. So um, we've been on a long time. I, we should probably get uh, our final thoughts and then come around for endorsements if if anyone has any. So. Um, all right. Uh, what order did we go in initially? All right, we did Drew, Tony, Julia, and Jason. Mr. Drew, um, and I, I apologize if we talked over you. It's, it's probably an injustice. But uh, uh, Lord, Lord knows I've talked over you guys in the past. <laughs> All right, lay it on us. Your final thoughts, uh, Exorcist Three. Well, um, I think this one succeeds where. Exorcist 2 failed by and large because it is, in in fact, a more straightforward, more simple, not everything in the chicken, you know, the kitchen sink kind of kind of movie. And, you know, it does sort of veer off with the, with this tacked on exorcism, but not not so badly off the rails that you can't really appreciate a lot of the fine things about it. And I, I just really like this movie and I was really happy to go back and rewatch it. I actually probably enjoyed rewatching this more than I, than I re- did rewatching the original, even though I, I will acknowledge the original is a better film. Mm-hmm. I just, I just really like this movie and I, I really hope that us doing it will uh, inspire people to, to hunt it down because it's certainly a worthwhile movie. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Tony, what are your final thoughts? Exorcist three. Yeah, I, I have to agree that like, upon rewatch, the ending isn't as good as I remembered it. In fact, and I feel I also have to say I do feel really bad that I didn't just go get a copy of Legion. I've been super busy. I should have gotten a copy and reread it because I know it's a quick read. Um, I remember when I first read it, just like tearing through it because it was really good um i was you know it goes beyond what you you know normally you read a novelization adaptation except this time the book comes first so you're like oh man i gotta read this and it was really a lot more faithful than i had imagined it when i first read the book and so i feel really bad i didn't reread it this time around but um i really really enjoy the movie there's so many great creepy parts so many good actors and you know, even the bit parts are really great. Um, a lot of old school psychological horror in addition to really cutting edge kind of stuff and just solid and this in the scissor scene gets me every time. Oh you're just like holy crap that's happening. <laughs> like it's just so good. Like oh man. Yeah, I would rewatch it. I am glad that I have it now on DVD. I'm really looking forward to Blu-ray. Um, you know, I hope that there's some extras. I hope they somehow find some footage or something uh, as extras or whatever. But I, uh, I really, really enjoy this. This is one I've been looking forward to since we started the podcast. Of like, hey, one day I want to do Exorcist Three because it's so very solid. You know, they could, you could do. Uh, a fan of it that just lifted um, saw the morning out. I bet you could do it and make it make it look sure. more or less normal. You know, I I can almost guarantee it. Um, you know, I've seen some really good edits like that. In fact, I know that Brad Dorif introduced some kind of renegade edit 
at a at a conference recently, and so hmm. it might have been one that did that. Um, That'd be cool. Yeah, Julia, final thoughts? Exorcist three. Well, I mean, I, I'm not as big a fan as Tony because of the fact that the, I do think that the bur- the director's cut, if there could be one, would be the movie that I would want to see. Um, if there's uh, all the all that footage that he wanted to use is disappeared for some reason. So hopefully maybe it'll turn up one day and he'll put out something different. Um, I, yeah, because I'm just really distracted by the whole exorcism part of it. Um, that being said, there's some neat stuff. I like the I like the relationships. I like the character studies. I like the psychological stuff, and I and I like the astral projection part of it because I just I always think that's a really interesting supernatural um, uh, genre, I guess, or whatever subgenre. So um, so yeah, there were some neat things, a couple of creepy things. No, I didn't feel like very scared by it. I don't know. This podcast has made me sort of. More um, known to be scared of it than I used to be. Yay! Hey, so we've it. done our job. I know, right? <laughs> I have to retire now. Um, I faced my fears. I feel like I've gone through therapy. It's been like what is it? Three years? <laughs> three years of therapy. I'm finally like cured from my horror movie phobia. Um, so yeah, it's you know it's enjoyable, and um, and I just wish that we could have the director's cut. That's all. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And and my final thought: there is actually a fan edit. So this is according to Wikipedia and uh, YouTube. There's a fan edit of this movie called Legion, done in 2011 by a, a guy called Spice Diver. That Brad Dourif actually presented this at a um, a horror convention in in North Carolina in March of uh, 2011. And he also did a Q and A. But it's basically an edit of this movie that takes out all the exorcism stuff, which sounds fantastic. I, I've got to see this. I would be very interested in, in seeing it. And if it could be accomplished by not adding anything but only taking away things, that sounds like something that would probably be worth just putting on the Blu-ray. You know? It's just, it's just an edit. Um, but, okay, my final thoughts. Uh, wonder, you know, a really enjoyable serial killer movie. I, I like the payoff. I like Brad Dourif's sensual role in it. And, you know, there are no hokey scenes. Even the stuff that gets added in, the, the Nicole Williamson stuff, is not hokey. It's a little unnecessary, but it doesn't make this a bad film. So this is pretty cool. William Blatty said that the greatest tragedy of this movie is that people didn't watch it for reasons that were the opposite of what the studios thought. The studios wanted it to be called Exorcist Three because they thought, hey, it needs to be tied to a franchise. Blatty was like, hey, forget all about that. People are going to associate it with Exorcist 2, and they're not going to go. And Blatty turned out to be correct in that assessment. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. But it's 15 years ago now, so nobody remembers. Unless you're listening all the way through our our uh, retrospective, be not afraid. Think not of Exorcist 2. Exorcist 3 is a, 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 a truly enjoyable horror movie. So, okay, let's do some endorsements, if you have anything to endorse. Um, Mr. Drew, do you have anything for us this week? Uh, self-servingly, I do, I do. Um, I my, my new issue of Hello, You Man comes out next Wednesday on Comixology. I'm inviting everybody who have, has not bought any of the issues of the regular series or the, the two specials that we have to go on there. This week, they're only $1.99 each. Please, catch up. Jump on. Get on the bandwagon. Do it now. We need all the fans we can get. If you like it, go tell your friend, hey, read this. Because, you know, everybody that's working on this comic is working very hard. And we need you to support uh, independent comics today. And that's, that's my sermon at the end of The Exorcist 3. That's wonderful. Uh, by the way, I, I just finished the uh, sequence of stories where um, uh, where Lucy uh, gains is, is turned into large Lucy, basically. The <laughs> character in in the Halloween Man is uh, also Halloween Man's girlfriend, and she becomes uh, plus sized after this one supervillain uh, creates a, basically a, a mighty weapon that 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 causes all the women in the world to gain weight. And Lucy decides she can't really fix it. And so instead she just sort of, it, it, in a way this becomes a really interesting uh, 
commentary, I think, on elements of the Fantastic Four as well. The fact that, that Reed Richards always tried to be really out there in the public eye because of how crazy they were in order to not cause the people to uh, to distrust them. It's good work. I've, I've been enjoying Halloween Man. So. Well, you know, the, that particular storyline is as crazy as it is, and it's kind of crazy. You know, I... It's garnered a lot of attention, and I, I've I've been I've been happy about that. You know, when 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 I first pitched it to the other people in the creative team, uh, particularly you know MonsterVerse, our, our publisher, I could tell there was a couple of people was like, "Well, I don't know about this, Drew. This is crazy." Even by by some of the you know your ideas normally are kind of crazy, but this one's really crazy. But yeah. you know, I had, I had something I I wanted to say and. Uh, I said it, and people, for the most part, have uh, have responded uh, positively. And uh, you know, I know it sounds kind of strange, but you know, it is it is done in a in a tongue in cheek way. So I mean, we're not expecting you to take such a ludicrous a ludicrous plot completely seriously. But there is there is a serious message in the in the core of that. No, it's it is it is really really cool. Um, so, all right, uh, Tony, did you have anything to endorse? I kind of went on a horror movie Netflix binge while I was doing some work, and so I would work on things and have a movie on in the background. And I somehow I, I may have seen it, but I think I kind of missed it. A film uh, called The Horror Show which is on Netflix, and it was billed as House 3 outside of the U.S., and it's also kind of a cousin slash baby stepbrother to The Shocker. (laughs) So it's kind of like if you liked The Shocker and you liked kind of the really, ha-ha, I'm going to say some one-liners kind of 80s, you know, ness of it, then I really do kind of recommend the horror show. It's fun. Um, it's got, you know, some really cool actors in it. Um, let's see. Oh, man, no, I'm drawing a blank because we're at the end of the show. Um, but it, it's really, it's really, really fun. I, I really, uh, I really recommend just the gleeful horrorness of it. Some great special effects. Lance Henriksen. Uh, Brian James, that's who I was trying to think of, uh, plays the villain, and he's always good villain material. Uh, hmm. But it's it's got, I don't know, it's got everything I kind of liked about renting a movie on the weekends and watching, you know, or catching something late on cable. Uh, it has all that stuff from 89 that I was really digging. So, um, So if you have Netflix, I recommend the horror show, even, you know, you have to be kind of in it, in that, you know, <laughs> you have to be in that mindset, you know, because there's lots of cheese, but there's lots of great cheese and lots of great effects, you know, so I that's that's what I'm going with, because it was, I was thoroughly kind of enjoying the retro horrorness of it, so. Fantastic. Well, uh, all right, Julia, did you have anything to endorse for us? I don't have anything new because I'm still binge watching Doctor Who from a couple seasons back. So. <laughs> what do you think about Peter Capaldi? Um, I like him. I think he's interesting. Very different. I just finished. Actually, I'm in the middle. I didn't finish watching. I, I'm in the middle of the Pompeii episode that he appears in early on as a character, and I'm trying to decide if if he actually could be the doctor with him, <laughs> or if it's just that that's where the doctor you know, this, pulled the this, face this from. Is like, this is actually the second time that somebody played a character, like a completely different character, and then got cast as the, as the doctor yeah. later. It's probably more than the second time, because I know Martha plays her own cousin, supposedly. Hmm. Anyway, but, um, yeah, but it's fun. It's such a great show. I'm really enjoying it. They used to do that on on uh, Law and Order all the time, they would essentially try out in, actors in a sense, or they would choose actors to be leads um, and call them from people who had played minor roles in previous seasons. And Absolutely. Um, and soap operas do that like like mm-hmm. crazy. And, and, and 
you know, so it'll be nuts. One character will will play two or three different major characters. I mean, one actor. Anyway, uh, for my part, I I have also been binge watching House of Cards, and I started a new book, so I just haven't been been watching enough stuff. Other than, um, so my one endorsement slash chatter for the week is this. I was bugged all day by the thought of that Halloween song that you sing in kindergarten. So we know the one that goes bum, 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 bum. We and are here to We are here to scare you. you. That's the way people remember it, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is that? Is it some classical piece? What is it? It turns out, if you ever wanted to know what is that song, it is, uh, it is an element of a song called Mysterious Moe's. It was written in 1930 as, and premiered as part of a Betty Boop cartoon. In fact, the first Betty Boop cartoon, which was Halloween-related, was called Mysterious Moe's. And you can look it up on YouTube. There's a couple things. There's Mysterious Moe's Betty Boop uh, original short. You can also find just the song. And there's a really, really great late 90s um, alternative animation that harkens back to all those Max Fleischer cartoons and stuff. Really, really good-looking stuff. And that's also called Mysterious Moe's. So um, that's just a little bit of, of looking forward to Halloween with, with, with some, some musical archaeology that you can take with you. If you hear somebody go, bump, 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 you can say, ah, that's Mysterious Moe's, 1930. So awesome. That's all I have for you. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Let me run down the list and see if I can remember it all. Uh, leave reviews for us on iTunes. That helps people find the show. Leave comments for us on our Facebook page. If you have friends who have not listened to the show, tell them to listen to the show. Bring them into your car. Like, kidnap them. Drive around. Play the, play the show <laughs> while you're listening to it. Um, if That's you a hear concern. Some, yeah, well, <laughs> if, if, you, if you hear somebody go, gosh, I was just thinking about the haunting, you can go, gosh, my show that I listen to, Castle of Horror, actually has an episode about the haunting or an episode about this or that. And, you know, we've got 100 episodes, so it's a really good shot that if you like a horror movie, we probably have already talked about it or we're going to coming up this year. In fact, coming up next are going to be um, two more Exorcist movies that will blow the mind because they are two and, in a sense, one. And then uh, a week after that, I think something to cap off the Exorcist movies. It is not quite an Exorcist movie, but will fit well. And then we're going to enter into four weeks of Halloween season. And I'm not even sure what it is that we're going to do. We might even put it up to a vote on the Facebook page. Thank you, everybody. The show is growing every week, and it's so exciting, and I hope that you guys stick around. Um, I appreciate having you guys on. Bye. Night. Night. Night.